Hey guys, welcome back to the channel today. I'm prepping the WRX to go to the track and figured I would make a quick video on brakes, right? So I see a lot of people ask questions about brakes all the time and figured we'd just cover some of the main, main topics. Uh, brake fluid, brake rotors, brake lines, and then brake pads. Uh, the first thing we'll cover is brake fluid. So brake fluid is kind of a must have upgrade when going to the track or driving your car hard uh, because you simply don't want the fluid to boil over and that pedal to get spongy, right? If you've got a spongy uh, brake pedal and it's not firm, uh, you've got bubbles in the lines and either that's, that could be because your brake fluid is boiled over or it's simply old and has absorbed some water dropping that boiling point. Uh, there are different types of brake fluid or dot ratings for brake fluid, uh, three, four, five. Um, some of them are compatible, right? So you can use like a dot three and a dot four in, in, in a, one braking system, but you can't use a dot five. So when you are out there shopping for brake fluid, just make sure you're picking up a dot rating that is compatible with your car. Okay. So outside of that, the most important thing, the most important thing to know about brake fluid is that it is hydrophilic. And what that means is that the brake fluid likes to absorb water from the outside atmosphere. Uh, and it's important to know that because when you are shopping for brake fluid, you're looking for two different numbers. Uh, you're looking at dry boiling point and wet boiling point. So what does that mean? Dry boiling point is when the fluid is fresh, right? That is the number at which the fluid will boil over, leading to a spongy brake pedal. Wet boiling point is a value that, uh, that you get when you start to absorb water into that brake fluid. Um, now it's obviously a gradient or range between dry and wet, um, but as the fluid gets old and it's exposed to the atmosphere more and more, it absorbs more and more water and that boiling point starts to drop. So when you're at the track and you're repeatedly beating on the brakes and you're heating up the pads and eventually some of that heat gets into the caliper and gets in the brake line, uh, the point at which it's going to boil over starts to drop. So obviously the fresher the fluid and the better quality of the fluid, the higher the boiling point and the more consistent you are going to have a, a stiffer, stiff pedal at the track. Um, there are different types and different brands of brake fluid, right? And, and so I've got one here that was given to me when I ordered some brake lines. It's a Sparta dot four fluid and it's boiling, the dry boiling point is 518. Um, for something like a dot three that you might get off a shelf at an O'Reilly's like this or AutoZone or a Kragen's, it might be somewhere in the high 400s or the low 500s. Uh, I use Modetool RBF 600 in my cars. I think it's pretty cheap uh, for what it is, and it's got a boiling point of almost 600. I know they have a RBF 660, which is higher, uh, and there are definitely brands out there that go even higher than that. Um, what I've noticed with the Modetool is that you tend to have to bleed the system out at least once a year, sometimes a little more. Uh, I don't take it past a year and a half. Uh, and there, there is, I think, a Castrol brand of brake fluid out there that's ridiculously expensive, and I think it might last a little longer. So suffice to say, there are many different options out there with varying degrees of wet and dry boiling points and uh, the ability to last longer. So there is a spreadsheet out there that someone made that documents all the different brands and the dry and the wet boiling points as well as the cost. And if I can find that spreadsheet, I will link it in the description below uh, so that you guys can nerd out and see which brand is the best bang for the buck. Okay, so having covered uh, brake fluid, let's talk about brake rotors. Let me go ahead and grab some out of the cabinet here. Okay, brake rotors. Uh, so we got one, two, three, four. So hopefully that covers just about all of them. All right, so this is a two-piece rotor. Uh, you can see here that there's a uh, hardware here that attaches this outer ring to this hat um, and it makes it easier to just buy these ring replacements instead of having to buy a whole rotor. This is a single piece rotor as you can see here. Uh, it's all cast in one piece. Um, so what other types of rotors can you get? Uh, this is what we'd call like a blank rotor so it's perfectly smooth. Uh, this is this is technically a J-hook rotor that's specific to AP racing, but essentially it's a slotted rotor, right? So there are grooves inside of the rotor face. Uh, they do a couple of things. 
They help uh, release gases that might build up when your pad material uh, goes from a solid uh, to a gaseous state. Uh, additionally, it helps clean the pad. So as the pad swipes over these hooks, they will scrub a little bit of pad off, uh, giving you a clean face uh, to, to, to have the pad touch uh, the rotor. Uh, that does tend to wear down the pads a little bit quicker, but in my opinion, it's marginal. Uh, and then lastly, you have a drilled rotor, which has holes drilled in. Now, which rotor is the best in terms of slotted, drilled, or blanks? Uh, really, if you're on a budget, you can go for the blanks. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the blank rotor. They're cheap to come by. They're easy to replace. Um, if you can afford it, go for the slotted ones. Uh, I think they're the best between uh, blanks and drilled. And uh, if you can avoid them, don't get drilled rotors. Um, the reason why is that the, the holes in the rotors tend to fill up with brake dust. Um, and so they're there to help release off gas, right? But once they fill up with brake dust, they're essentially useless. Uh, so it's kind of pointless to have the holes. Additionally, as brake rotors heat cycle, right? So you get hard on the brakes coming off a straight, the, the rotors heat up, and then you get, get back on the gas, and the veins on the rotors pull the air in, the rotor cools off, that's a heat cycle. As they start to heat cycle, they'll start to develop cracks in the face of the rotor. They'll start off really small, and they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, at some point, all the cracks will kind of line up, and from the inner diameter edge to the outer diameter edge, the crack will get all the way through, and you'll crack your rotor. On drilled rotors, those cracks tend to happen much faster because there's already a hole in the face of the rotor. So you tend to get cracks quicker, and they tend to kind of all match up and crack across the entire face faster. So overall, drilled rotors, not worth getting. I would, I would suggest you avoid them. Um, okay. So outside of the types of rotors that you can get, single, like single piece, two piece, and then the types of um, kind of faces that you can get, uh, know that rotors also have veins. So this is a veinless rotor, right? You can see here that it's just a face on both sides and it's a solid piece. This is a veined rotor. And as you can see, it has veins between the two faces. So what do the veins do? As the, as, the, as the rotor is spinning with the hub, because it's mounted on the hub, it's actually sucking air through the back. And the veins suck air in and then expel them out. And that's what helps cool the rotor down after a hard uh, stop. The more veins you have in the rotor, uh, the quicker it cools down. The more air is, is sucked in through the back and, and out uh, the face of the rotor. Um, so you'll see with some rotors, you might only get 40 veins and other rotors, you'll get 70 veins. So the more veins, uh, the quicker the rotor will cool down. It doesn't mean it's going to get uh, any less hot. It'll still get to the same temperature. It'll just cool down quicker. Okay. So now we understand veins. Uh, what about the obsession with size? It's funny. Okay. So contrary to popular belief, uh, you want a bigger rotor overall because it's essentially your heat sink, right? This is what dissipates heat uh, in your braking system, not the calipers. Uh, if your calipers are dissipating heat, you've got a problem because your fluid comes in contact with your pistons, et cetera, et cetera. You're just going to boil over, boil over your brake fluid. So really, this is what cools down your brakes. Uh, the bigger the rotor, the more mass you have, the more heat it can take. Uh, and the more it can draw heat away from the pads and keeping that heat from getting into the caliper and boiling over your fluid. Now, obviously, it's a balancing act. You could have a very large rotor and never heat them up, but then weight becomes a challenge, right? So choosing uh, the right rotor size, if you can, or if you're looking at a big brake kit, it kind of matters. Sometimes bigger is overkill and it's not necessarily um, desirable. That pretty much covers the types of rotors that you'll see. Um, and uh, I would say if you can, try to go for um, kind of a high-end, uh, higher-end higher brand of rotor. Uh, they tend to be made of better metal. 
Um, and the quality of the metal does matter because as you start to heat cycle over and over and over and over again, uh, the metal fatigues and uh, better quality metal will be less likely to crack as quickly. Um, now, if you can't afford it, go for the cheap stuff, but you may find that you're going to be replacing rotors uh, a lot more often. Okay, so that just about covers rotors. Let's talk about brake pads really quick. So I see this question all the time. Hey, I want to upgrade my brakes. Uh, what pads do you recommend? That's a loaded question because with pads, there is, there is no, you know, silver bullet or one size fits all. Um, with brake pads, you're looking for a couple, you're looking at a couple different things. You're looking at, you need to look at what type of driving you're doing. Um, whether or not it's track driving or daily driving, because that is going to define the temperature range that you need the pads to work in. Um, you want to look at whether or not you can withstand squealing, right? Because the material the pad is made out of uh, can make it more prone to squeaking and squealing when you make stops. Uh, then you want to look at dust, right? Uh, some pads have very friendly dust, um, so they will make dust but the dust is easy to clean off and, and hose off and it won't damage your rims or damage your paint. Some pads won't make any dust. And then some pads will make dust that if you hit it with water, pretty much turn into cement and cake onto your rims, right? So uh, that is all kind of gonna drive your buying decision when you're looking at brake pads. Um, and I will say that if you are going to the track, um, you definitely wanna have pads that are up for the duty uh, in terms of temperature range. So this is an example of not choosing the correct pad for your car. Uh, these are Carbotech XP8s, and uh, I was running these on the WRX for, uh, I don't know, three or four events. The problem was these pads couldn't take the temperature, right? So I was taking the car, stopping hard, and what ended up happening was I exceeded the temperature rating of the pad. And uh, when that happens, the pad glosses over and it becomes very smooth and the pad has no bite at all. Uh, so stopping the car became a challenge, right? It's not that the car wouldn't stop. I would just have to brake 200, 300 feet earlier and really hard, right? Uh, so th that was just my mistake. I chose the wrong pad. I've since upgraded to a higher temperature range pad and uh, I don't glaze my pad over. So I don't know if you can tell, um, this pad is a very, very shiny surface to it and not so much with this pad. Uh, and I think you can even hear it, see this? This likes to slide very easily and this has a much more abrasive sound to it. So temperature range does matter. The drawback usually to higher temperature pads is that they tend to be made out of a more metallic compound or formulation and they tend to squeak. So if you're looking for pads that don't squeak, it's maybe, it may be challenging to find a pad that you can take to the track that doesn't squeak. Um, but if you're daily driving, then you can obviously go for a pad at a lower temperature range um, that has less of a metallic formulation and will be much quieter. Let's see. The other thing you want to look at when you're looking at brake pads is the coefficient of friction. So the friction provided by the pad is essentially how much force, uh, friction force it provides against the rotor when you step on the brakes. Um, and some pads will have a very consistent friction range, meaning across the temperature range, it's the same coefficient of friction. And that gives you a very predictable pad. Right, so for a race, a car on a racetrack or a race car, uh, you want a pad that's going to respond the same over a very wide range of temperature. Now, maybe if you're autocrossing a car and you can't get to that temperature range, you want a pad that heats up very quickly. So what you do is you might look at, say, like a Carbotech XP AX6, I think it's called, and those are very nonlinear pads. They heat it very quickly, and the friction just spikes the coefficient of friction just spikes as the temperature just starts to move. Um, so they provide a lot of grip uh, or a lot of friction, very low end in the temperature range. But if you were to take them to a track, you'd likely overheat them, glaze them, 
Uh, and it wouldn't provide that kind of modulation that you're looking for, that control with the brake pedal, right? Because that ramp of the coefficient, uh, the coefficient of friction would just make it seem like as you were getting into the pedal, the car would stop faster and faster and faster. Uh, the other thing you want to look at is pad thickness. Um, so this is obviously a very, very thick brake pad, and it's for my AP Racing um, brake kit. Uh, these are 20 millimeter pads, right? So they're much thicker than pads you would get on kind of like your OEM Brembo setup. And uh, they cost a little more, but there's a little bit more meat here, so the pads tend to last longer if you're going to long like endurance sessions. Um, or if you're just doing high performance DE events, uh, they're just going to last you through more events, right? So if you are looking at an aftermarket big brake kit, it's nice to have the option to go with a thicker pad. So the other advantage to a thicker pad is heat rejection. So you just simply have more material between the rotor surface and the pistons. Um, and that means uh, it, the heat has to travel through the pad further to get to your caliper. Um, so thicker pads also help with heat management. Okay, so I want to briefly touch on calipers. And um, there's this obsession between uh, two piston, four piston, six piston calipers. You know, why, why choose a four piston over a six piston or a six piston over a four piston? Um, there's tons of arguments. And so I'm going to miss some of them, but a couple of very basic ones are packaging. Uh, a four piston is going to be smaller than a six piston setup, so you can fit a smaller rim on the car. Smaller rim means cheaper tires, <laughs> right? Maybe not as wide, um, but smaller diameter. Uh, but if you want to run a bigger rim, uh, you, then you can run a bigger caliper setup. Uh, you can run a, probably a wider tire. Uh, and then you kind of get into the whole thing about weight. So four pistons is likely going to be lighter than a six piston. And if you don't need the extra cooling benefits of a, of a rotor that comes on a six piston, is it really worth it to go to a six piston setup, right? And it also depends on your tires. Are you running sticky enough tires to run aggressive, aggressive enough brake pads to generate enough heat to warrant such a big rotor? So there's a little bit of thought there that needs to happen uh, before you kind of go out and just buy a six piston setup because you want one. I'm not saying they're not great, uh, just saying that it may be overkill. Okay, but why is there a four piston versus a six piston? Is it just about the size of the rotor? No, it's actually not. And it's about how the pads wear. Uh, so if, oh man, I don't know if you can see this. Pads will tend to have a taper on them and the leading edge of the pad will tend to wear faster than the lagging edge, right? So if we look at the pad like this, uh, let's look at it like this, and let's say the rotor is spinning in this direction, this edge is gonna wear faster than this lagging edge. Um, and so if you were to measure the thickness here and then down at the bottom, you will find that the bottom is thicker and this top, this leading edge is thinner. So a six piston setup is, is one of the goals is to help to, to minimize this uh, this taper that you get in the pad. So that's one advantage of a six piston setup. You can't completely eliminate it, uh, but a six piston will help alleviate some of the problem. Uh, the other thing is um, it's as simple as just flipping the pad, right? I can take the pad from the other side, flip it, and now uh, the lagging edge, which is thicker, is now the leading edge on the other side, and now I can kind of help even out my pad. Uh, so that is uh, kind of pad taper. The other thing you'll find, and this doesn't have anything to do with four piston or six piston, is that the pad on the inside of the rotor will tend to wear faster than the pad on the outside of the rotor. And I think this has to deal with, or part of um, the reason is because uh, your fluid comes into the back of your caliper, right? And so it tends to do, the pistons there tend to do more work uh, because the fluid comes straight in and then the pistons on the outside do a little less work because it has to hit the crossover pipe and come around and push the pistons on the other side. So if you look at these two pads, these came off, um, 
These came off, I believe, the same caliper. And one is the inside and one is the outside. And the outside one is a little bit thicker than the inside one. So same solution here for that is if you're taking your inside and you're moving it to your outside and flipping it, um, you're going to help deal with uh, the taper and then you're going to help uh, even out the pad thickness. So I think that covers that. Um, and then we can talk briefly about brake lines. Brake lines. On the left, you have a rubber brake line or a standard brake line that you would get on most cars. Uh, that's off the WRX. On the right, this is a braided brake line uh, that's actually for the E30. Um, really, at the end of the day, I don't think brake lines are a mandatory upgrade for uh, tracking your car or, or driving your car hard in the mountains, uh, simply because you know, if your brake line, if your rubber brake lines are new, they're probably going to be relatively uh, stiff. Uh, and so you're not going to get a lot of give out of the pedal. Um, if they're old and you're looking to replace them, yeah, go for a stainless steel brake line. Essentially all it is is a brake line that has um, a braiding around the hose uh, to keep the hose from... Uh, kind of expanding when you step on the brake pedal. So instead of taking that energy that you're putting into the pedal and expanding the hose, it's just pushing the fluid into the caliper. Um, so if, you're, if your rubber lines are new, you know, it's, it's probably not worth the money to upgrade them uh, unless you're like doing some work and you're gonna have to take them off anyway. Uh, but if they're old, it might be worth uh, spending the extra hundred bucks or so and getting some uh, stainless steel uh, braided brake lines. Uh, on some higher performance cars, not on the Subaru, uh, you'll see that they wrap metal around the rubber brake line. So there'll be like a like a outer coil that goes around it uh, and holds the line tight. Uh, and that's essentially what the stainless uh, braided stainless steel brake lines are doing, right? It's just the sheath is in here. Whereas um, on I know my Cayman has this. There's a metal that's wound around the brake line to keep it from, from bowing out. Otherwise, um, you know, there's really not much to uh, braided brake lines. Uh, just make sure you're getting them from uh, a good manufacturer and that they are uh, certified to work on the road or meet certifications uh, for road cars. Um, some of the brands that you can look at are StopTech or uh, Spiegler. Um, and I think Goodridge is another one. So I think that covers most of it for, for brakes. If you do have questions or I missed something uh, or I got something wrong, please don't hesitate to comment in the, section, in the comment section below. And uh, until next time, uh, thanks for watching.